comes to mind when you ponder the word life? How about if we expand that word to a phrase, the eight facets of life? This week on Faith and Friends, we begin a two-part series on that very topic, the eight facets of life. Mark Kuntz sits down with author and speaker Chris Conley, who offers us some simple ideas that can mean complex and important changes in our lives and the lives of those around us. Before we get started, let's dive into the best place to find simple direction in life, the Bible. John 14, 6 and 7 includes both the words Jesus and life. Can't get any better than that. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Life certainly comes through the life. That is Jesus. That's right. It is the one way. It is the only way, but it is an incredible life. Yeah. There's nothing like it. Well, before we get started in our show, more about life is coming. A quick reminder that auction donations are now accepted Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Make this guy work. Bring some stuff on a day he's here <laughs> and he'll unload it for you, maybe. 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 We'll see. Can't be too hot. <laughs> Our ability to do pickups is very limited, but if you can get your items to us, we are able to take them, even if Andy's not able to unload <laughs> the truck. We'll find some other people. Just a short list of the items we're unable to take. Um, that includes TVs, entertainment pipe centers. Organs. Pipe organs. That's true. Pipe organs, pianos, clothing, books, and... Half-eaten cake. We'll take uneaten cake. But not half-eaten cake. You really won't even take half-eaten cake? I draw the line there. Yeah. Like, sorry, my, my microphone just about dropped off. That's all right. We don't take broken microphones. We don't take broken microphones either. <laughs> well, if you have any questions about what we can and cannot take, you can call us at 419-339-4444 and ask for Michelle, myself or Michelle. Living life to the fullest, finding contentment amidst a chaotic, sinful world, staying true to God's word in our daily lives. These are just a few of the concepts to be discussed as we introduce you to author and speaker Chris Conley. How do we achieve balance in our life? It's something we all talk about, but oftentimes have tr tr struggle, trouble, finding a way to do that. Well, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we're going to help you do just that as we're joined by Chris Conley. And Chris, you've developed what you call the eight facets of life, a way to achieve balance in life. And, you know, the old saying goes, I may not be where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. And that's kind of the core of the first principle we're going to talk about, which is personal development. Right. Uh, from a personal development standpoint, I think many people put this aspect on cruise control. And, uh, and this can be really dangerous because unless we're uh, reading new books to get new ideas, listening to CDs, talking with other people, there's no way we're going to be better tomorrow than we were today. Um, I think one of the stories that I heard some time ago really made this evident to me. And it's, a, it's the idea that we've all traveled, or most of us, uh, the flight attendant would come on the uh, intercom and say, uh, in the event the cabin pressure drops, oxygen mask will drop from the ceiling, make sure that you secure yours before helping others. And if you're traveling with a child or grandchild, you might be thinking, well, I'm gonna take care of them first. But in the commotion, if we fail to even secure ours, we're no, no good to anyone else. So as we can make ourselves smarter, wiser, it's going to have that ripple effect on the people that we love and care for the most. Absolutely. I mean, we, we have to improve ourselves before we can even start thinking about improving anybody else. Exactly. Yep. And as, as you said, this is kind of the first step of, of several steps we're going to go through. Why, is it, why do you think personal development is so important? Well... It has that ripple effect on everything else, I think, because um, I've learned more about being a better parent after my kids were gone than I did at the time. You know, I think we just get caught up in the um, he hectic parts of life. And um, if we're not in tune with trying to learn more, then we just leave it to chance. And, and sometimes that's a poor teacher. And as we, we learn more, we have that opportunity to be there for others then. Exactly. I think the frustrating part to me has been, as I've tried to share what I've learned with others, that not everybody wants to hear that. But that really can't stop us from trying. Um, as, as we share something that's worked or a good place to visit, whether it's a website, uh, listen to this CD or read this book, a lot of people are going to let that fall on deaf ears. But uh, many people will follow through, and that's what's encouraging. So despite the fact that people may not 
um, follow up on that, it still shouldn't deter us because we still want what's best for us and what's best for them. You know, and I, I think maybe some of our viewers might be sitting at home thinking to themselves, well, I, I'm advanced, I'm, I'm at a stage of my life where I, I, I can't learn anymore, I can't grow anymore, mm -hmm. but that's certainly not the case. No, I, I don't think, I've never met someone that I would classify as a 10. On a scale of 1 to 10, I always tell people in my talks that if you think you're a 10, you're not, because a 10 is perfection, and uh, there's always something we can learn, and we can learn something from everyone. What, uh, what are some other tips you have for personal development? Well, I think the big thing is, um, it, whether it's going to a seminar, class, um, I go there w with the idea that I'm going to learn something. So I'm going to take notes, I'm going to sit in the front row, um, I'm going to listen to CDs. I got in that habit uh, the last 10 years I worked where I didn't just sit there to get there. I, you know, it was Automobile University, as Zig Ziglar talked about. And uh, I, I learned an immense amount of information during that time. And some people feel like, well, I can't take notes, but you'd be surprised how much you can retain and make a couple notes when you do arrive at work. Um, or you can always listen to CD again. So when, when you find something that's really good. You know, I think one of the things you're kind of touching on is education doesn't end when we get a piece of paper. Education should be a continuing thing. Sure. Yep. And, and for me, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, I've, I'm not about to read books anymore. But like I say, if, if you're not reading books or other material, listening to CDs or getting information from people, you're not going to develop any more than just what maybe comes your way. And we live in an information age where there's lots of resources out there. And, you know, as you kind of touched on, you know, there's books, there's, you know, things on, on CD, and there's a lot of information on the Internet that, that right. probably scares some people to get online. But, you know, the Internet's a tool just like any other tool that can be used for good. Right. Yeah, the podcasts that I listen to now are kind of doing away with the CDs. I don't think some cars are even coming out with CDs anymore. Now, in the coming weeks, we're going to be going through some other aspects of your eight facets of life. But before we do that, how did you come up with, with these eight facets? Well, I, I had a supplier at my work that would give out the uh, planners every year. And uh, one year around Christmas time, I, I got to looking. And then, you know, the typical one had the months, and uh, it had the contact information. But there was a page on goals. And as I looked at that, I thought, well, I always had career goals. They were kind of mandated if I wanted to get pay raises, promotions, I had to take that serious. And then the finance and the uh, health always made sense because they're easy to track. But these other areas, I never really set a goal. And it just made me think that if I didn't set goals in those areas, these are areas that most of us say are most important, our faith, our family, relationships, then they're just going to get what's left. So that's what got me thinking in this direction. Personal development, the first of the eight facets of life. And Chris does teach his eight facets of life through workshops. So if you're interested in having him talk to your group or your organization, you can contact him through email at theconleys102 at gmail.com. Balance, an important aspect for all in life. It certainly can be difficult to achieve in this fast-paced world, but it is so important. Next, we move to facet number two. We return to Mark, who is with Chris Conley, as they discuss the topic of family. You know, family is one of those buzzwords that can encapsulate many things and encapsulate many different things to people. And we're here talking about family as one of the eight facets of life with Chris Conley, our continuing series about achieving a balanced life. And earlier, Chris, we talked about personal development, and that mm. leads right into family because in order to have a better family, I think we all need to be better people, and family is one of the keystones to achieving a better, achieving a balanced life. Right. It's the, one of the areas, probably the top two, that people would say is the most important in their life. Let's uh, first off talk about how maybe society paints a, a picture that is constantly changing when it comes to family, but mm. perhaps isn't giving us the right message when it comes to family. Right. I think one of the things that, that I read years ago that um, brought this to my attention was that society tells us that half of all marriages fail. And the truth is, about 75 to 80 percent of first marriages are successful. But what skews the numbers is the data looks at there were 1,200 marriages, there were 1,200 divorce filings, there were 2,000, 2,000. And that's so skewed because 
Second marriages fail at about a 70% rate. Third marriage is at about a 50, and fourth marriage is at on about a 30. So it seems that once people decide to end their marriage, it's much easier to end the second, third, fourth. So if we're just looking at the total numbers, it skews the data. So I think as we tell young people that it's a 50-50 proposition, it's easy to say, well, it hasn't worked out for half the population, let's just throw in the towel, and that's not the truth. It's almost setting people up to fail if they're going into a marriage thinking, well, statistics tell me right. this is going to fail anyways. Exactly. And as we, we try and find the love languages, ex explain that to me. Yeah, uh, gone along the lines of personal development, this was a book that was recommended to me probably by five different people over the course of two or three years. And the title didn't entice me to read it. But after enough people had recommended it, um, I actually went to the library and, and got it on audio. And I listened it to and from on my work commute, and it, it made all the sense in the world to me. Gary Chapman is the author, and he asked the question, is your love tank full? And he identified there's five primary love languages that we have, and they are words of affirmation, uh, acts of service, quality time, gifts, and physical touch. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that if your spouse, the way I say I love you to my spouse is through words of affirmation, I could be doing the dishes, I could be giving her hugs and everything else, but if I'm not giving her words of encouragement, it's not saying I love you. And so it's important that we understand what is it that says I love you to each other. And if you go to the website, the five love languages.com, there's a free test anyone can take. And it's about a series of 20 or 30 questions and it'll, it'll spit out a printout of what is your primary secondary love language. And I think that kind of circles back to one of the things we talked about earlier with personal development is if we can see what the, the five love languages are and recognize maybe what we're deficient in, then we can build on that and be, have a, a better relationship with our family members by understanding maybe how they need to hear those love languages from us. Exactly. And like I say, it's different for everyone. And, and he goes on to say it's rare that a spouse would have the same love language. Typically, uh, one might be quality time and one might be gifts or something like that. And gifts isn't have to be expensive, diamonds and whatnot. You know, sometimes it's just the fact I was thinking of you and I bought you this. Speaking of gifts, uh, we've all been there where we've given a child a gift and we pay, perhaps put a lot of thought and effort into that gift and the child doesn't necessarily care about the gift, cares about the effort, maybe cares about the, the wrapping paper, the box the right. gift came in. Children kind of see gifts differently than adults do. They do, but he talks in his book also that uh, the children also have that primary love language. And he, I remember a talk he gave where he gave an example of uh, when he came home from work, his two-year-old would grab hold of him and oh, he didn't want to let go. Well, his primary love language was physical touch. So in order to say I love you to that small child, it was a series of hugs, taking walks, holding hands, things along that line. His four-year-old daughter would grab his hand and want to take, her to, take him to his room to show her what she'd done all day. So her love, primary love language was quality time. And he further made, made the comment that uh, if your child has a primary love language of gifts, that you could be walking on your lunch hour and uh, see a, a, a shiny stone that sparkled in the sunlight and take that home and give it to a five-year-old. And if their primary love language is gifts, chances are that five-year-old will still have that rock when he's 25 years old. And I think the other thing to keep in mind with, with children particularly is the gift isn't necessarily as important as spending the time with the child. Exactly. Yep. And what other tips do you have as we look to achieve balanced life through family? I think it's important that we just make memories, you know, with our children because, um, like you said, the boxes seemed, as a young age, seemed to, to be more appropriate than what the gift was. And we all know that, we talk about it, but we continue to shower them with more gifts. We want th it seems like we want them to have things that we didn't enjoy growing up. But um, I can recall with my own children, we took a lot of nature walks, and we still talk about those things today in their, in their 30s. So uh, it's not at all about the cost that you spend. Chris Conley talking about the importance of family and taking time to make memories with your family. Andy, you and Leah seem to do that. You, you guys are always doing special things that your kids are going to remember. We're trying, and part of that is because I like to experience things, and so we might as well bring them along as well. But we try and do stuff, the four of us, and also one-on-one uh, -on -one time where I take my daughter out. We, Leah is taken out by my son. Yeah. Always he likes to come to the door and knock on the door and 
uh, try and teach him those ways early. And then also guys' time and, and girls' time as well. It's, it's important because we know those times are going to slip away very quickly. It's the number one thing folks tell us is they grow up fast, enjoy them. So uh, we're doing our best. And also one of the things that we've been told over the years by really high up CEOs of companies, that when, they, when they're on their deathbed, they say the number one thing they wish they would have done more is spend time with their family, not make an extra million dollars or uh, get those extra hours in at work or the gym. They want that time with their family. So we're trying to make the most of that too. Yes. Well, now it's time to expand that idea of family into relationships. Facet number three in the eight facets of life. It's been asked when you're in a conversation with someone, are you actively engaged in that conversation or are you simply waiting for your chance to talk? Well, we're joined now by author Chris Conley as we continue our series on the eight facets of life, a, a common sense approach to achieving a balanced life. And we've talked about personal development, we've talked about family, now we're going to talk about relationships. And, and the key to this, I think, maybe goes back to kind of to what I alluded to, is when we're in a conversation with somebody, are we really engaged in that conversation or are we just simply waiting for our chance to talk? Right. And, and I think that's, so many people are that way. They wait for that um, opening to get their story in. So as we look to balance our life through relationships, the question we're going to come to for this segment is talking about what is a true friend? Yeah, and I think, I think the number one answer to that that I hear is a true friend accepts me as I am. And that sounds good on the surface, but I think the guy at the drive through window accepts you as you are. You know, you pay your money and you're on your way. I think the better definition is uh, a true friend is someone who holds me to a higher standard, someone that encourages me, but also is there to correct me if I'm out of line. And I think it goes back to challenging us. Right. People that we remember, the people we want to be around are those that challenge us at some level. Right. Yeah. I think we're there for each other. Um, they help us, we help them. And so it's that kind of relationship. And that goes back to <clears throat> something we heard quite often growing up, something that we've probably told our our children, our grandchildren, our, our nieces, our nephews, or what have you, is who you are around really will influence, will impact on who you become. Yeah, you know, and, and the question is, at what age is that not an issue? Because we know it's an issue when we're five, but it's also an issue when we're 35 or 55. The people we're around are going to either pull us up or drag us down. And I guess, you know, and this kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier about personal development. If we want to grow, if we want to continue to get better, then it behooves us to not only surround ourselves with people who are going to challenge us, have relationships that are going to better us, but also help other people to get better. Right. I mean, we're, we're there for each other. That, and uh, there's no doubt that as uh, the people help us, we're going to help them, whether it be through the mentor or through the mentee. That mentor-mentee relationship, I, I think, is unique. I think that's something that, that has grown <coughs> maybe over the last 15 years. Maybe it's, it's just that we've gotten to the point where we're more comfortable saying mentor-mentee. I think that kind of relationship has always been there through true friendship. Yeah, I, I agree. And many times a mentor might not even be someone that we'd associate as a friend. You know, it's just there as a, a, a person that can help us because they've experienced something that we haven't had the opportunity, but we seek out. And you've touched on this a little bit. Um, friendship's a two-way street. We can't just demand something out of somebody mm -hmm. and expect them to give it to us unconditionally, which we often do with family, but we're not talking about family. We're talking right. about the others, the friendship. It's important to be a friend in order to have a friend. Right. Um, I think if you say, I'm going to, I'm looking for friends, they're going to be few and far to find. But if, if I want to be a friend, it seems like they come out of the woodwork. So I think you have to, uh, be there for others first, and then it'll reciprocate in time. What other tips do you have when, when we're talking about relationships? I think a big thing is um, uh, through a book I read talking about friendships and, and made a comment on the associations that we have in our life. There's an expanded association that we should search out for people that bring out the best in us, and uh, uh, so naturally we want to spend more time with them. And then there's a limited association for the people that, you know, it could be an aunt or an uncle or whoever, uh, we're going to be around them, but 15 minutes or an hour might be enough. We don't want to spend a day or a week with them. But then there's also disassociation. And, and I don't look at this as an unchristian point of view because <clears throat> there are some people that just don't bring out the best in us and maybe put us in a situation we don't want to be in. 
So we have to, uh, might have to disassociate with some people. And that can be difficult, but it, it, at times we do have to make those decisions that mm -hmm. this relationship isn't doing us any good. We need to find relationships which are going to build us and also be reciprocal and, and build the other end of that relationship. Right. You know, it's been said that our relationships give us our highest highs and our lowest lows. And, uh, you know, the world's full of people and, and we're, we're to be there for each other. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Chris has written about the eight facets of life for several different newspapers, and he is available to teach the eight facets of life. If you're interested in bringing him in as a workshop for your group or your organization, you can contact him via email at theconleys102 at gmail.com. And these episodes are also available online on our website, faithandfriends.wtlw.com. We now move into facet four of the eight facets of life by Chris Conley. This one has to do with your present quality of life as well as your future. We're talking about health and in this next segment, Chris offers some simple but important life changes you can make that are keys to enjoying life not only now, but for many years to come. We've already talked about personal development, family and relationships, and now we're going to talk a little bit about health mm -hmm. and health both being Physical and mental. I think a lot of what we've talked about with relationships is about the mental health, mm -hmm. but physical health is right there and just as important. It certainly is. And physical health kind of touches on everything, and it's, it's a commitment more than anything else. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a way of life. When we think about diet, it's all about what we can't do. So if we think about it's a way of life, it's, I, I remember someone making a comment, I'm not on a diet, I'm just holding myself accountable for what I eat. If, if you think about it, then it's perfectly okay to, to have that pizza one night if you're going to make up for it in the next couple of days, maybe increase your workout or what have you. But it's <coughs> health is an area that we all want to do better in. How can we go about making sure we hold ourselves accountable? Well, the big thing is, like you say, we're not going to neglect having fun. Uh, we're going to eat the foods we enjoy. It's just a matter of uh, being educated, which I don't think that's a problem. It's more about the discipline that I'm going to give in today, but I'm going to be right back on it tomorrow. You know, it's amazing how many of the, the simple truths we learned many, many years ago that as we grow older and are more educated, we find out those are actually pretty good truths. Right. And one of those is, is moderation, that you can have a little bit of everything or anything as long as you do it in moderation. Exactly. As we, we look at uh, health, it's a way of life, and also the other thing is, you know, it, it's often easy to go, well, I can start that diet next week. I can start that workout regime next month. I, I need to get over this. I need to get over that before I can do anything, and those are really just excuses. Exactly, and, and I think that's what we fight, especially with the health aspect. Um, the trouble is many of the decisions we make won't kill us today, but they have devastating consequences long term. So. I hear people talk about baby steps and I buy into that completely because we, we need to make healthy choices and as we make them, they become more ingrained to make that lifestyle change. Well, and you look at something like high blood pressure, which is a, a serious problem throughout the country and that is certainly one of those things where you can have high blood pressure for, for decades and go, well, I, I feel okay, I don't have any <clears throat> exterior signs, but what it's doing, it's, it's shaving off years at the end of your life. And it's something that some small steps can, can help maybe extend your life. Right. I, I remember uh, The Biggest Loser. I, I don't watch it anymore. But at one time, the contestants would be told, you're 26, but you've got the body of a 60-year-old. And that was always seemed to be earth-shattering, you know, and, and an emotional time for them to hear that. But then it was on the flip side, uh, six months later, they were told that now they're three years younger than their actual chronological age. And a lot of that goes back to... <clears throat> Perhaps we don't have the long view of life that we need to. You know, it's easy to say this generation, this current generation, wants to live for the now. But mm -hmm. I think they've been saying that for 60, 70 years, that people only are concerned about living for the now. And they aren't holding themselves accountable for what could happen down the road. Right. Um, you know, I, I remember the commercial, pay me now or pay me later. And I think it was a Midas commercial. But that's, I think that goes right along with what we're talking about, that we can do what we want today, but there's going to be consequences down the road. So... Um, we know as we age, it doesn't get any easier. So if we're not going to take care of ourselves at this point, it's only going to make it more difficult down the road. 
you know, in, in your eight facets of life, you kind of have a, of a diagram of them in a circle, which kind of shows that they're all interrelated. Mm -hmm. And health certainly touches on personal development, touches on family, touches on relationships, because let's face it, if, if our health is going to preclude us from having a relationship, that certainly is a reason to, to get the health in better balance. Right. There's a saying that goes, a man with a toothache cannot be in love, basically meaning that if, you, if you're in pain, you can't think about anything else. So it's not to say it's the most important because as you mentioned, they're all intertwined, but uh, health is something we've got to take care of to be there for others. What are some other tips you have for, for folks who are looking <clears throat> to, to better their health? Yeah, I think the baby steps issue is number one. Um, but I heard Dr. Oz and I heard this other expert say that they thought that the number one thing that people could change right now is sleep. Uh, the fact that we're not well rested uh, leads us to make worse choices with our diet. We might grab some sugary food or starchy food, you know, to give us that emotional boost. Uh, a second thing was water, water intake. Um, I think if we get less of the sugary drinks and we can get used to drinking water, um, that's definitely a plus. And then the third item I would say would be just walking. Um, and those are all really easy things to do. The thing is, these are simple, but they're not easy. You know, not easy to maintain and not easy to always tell ourselves that this is what I need to do regularly. You know, it's, it's easy to lose weight. All you have to do is exercise more and eat less. Mm -hmm. Two simple steps, but the hard part is that commitment to continue to exercise more and eat less. Exactly. And, it, you know, it, if it's raining, we need to have a backup plan, you know. Maybe I can't get the same workout if I'm used to being outside, but there's something I could do in my house or later in the day or, you know, you just have to make those adjustments. So we've talked about personal development, we've talked about family, we've talked about relationships. And a as we wrap up this discussion on health, you, you mentioned sleeping more, drinking more water, getting that regular routine. I, I would also add having an awareness of what works best for you, making sure you, what you're doing is what's going to work for you. Right. Because if it is something that you enjoy, you're going to maintain it. So it can't be just because it worked for my aunt or my best friend that it's, it's my issue as well. All right. Thank you very much, Chris Conley. And if you would like to have Chris <clears throat> teach his eight facets of life to your organization or your group, he is available to workshop this topic. You can contact him at theconleys102 at gmail.com. You can also view our earlier episodes of The Eight Facets of Life on our website, faithandfriends.wtlw.com. That's just the first four points in The Eight Facets of Life. You can tune in next week for the final four installments in this series featuring author and speaker Chris Conley. Oh, yeah, so important to take some time and focus on these aspects. Mm -hmm. Our lives are so quickly moving, but like you mentioned earlier about taking time with family, we mm -hmm. also need to take time with our health, take time with all of these mm, things. No question. Good insight for living by Chris, and you'll want to hear the rest of it next week. And a great family event coming up, of course, our TV44 auction mm. the first Saturday after Labor Day. We certainly love to see your stuff arrive here at TV44 as we prepare for the upcoming auction. We really love getting furniture, also tools, mowers, automobiles, and we'll gladly take your collectibles, antiques, garage sale, and boutique items. TV44 is open for auction drop-offs Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Hey, we actually have someone who wants to donate a sauna. It's a three-person sauna. We're not sure that we're actually going to be able to get this out of the person's house. Hmm. But if you are interested in a sauna and want to purchase it, we can send you pictures of it. And then oh, wow. we can connect you with the lady who wants to, to sell it and... Um, there's a, a, you wouldn't even have to come to the auction. You wouldn't have to wait. It could be yours next week. This is like Craigslist, live on Christian 44. Craigslist. <laughs> Let's take a look at scripture. One final time, John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you've seen him. Thanks for joining us this week. Live life with the Father and through the life of Jesus.